Good evening. My name is George Parsons. I'm the president of Arlington Historical Society. Thank you all for tuning in to this uh, remote lecture series. Um, hopefully sometime in the spring we'll be able to meet in person, but for right now we have to do it this way. Um, this has been a difficult year for the Historical Society, but we've come through it quite well. Um, you'll be hearing from Robert Brazil, our first vice president, about the geothermal uh, system that's being installed in the Jason Russell House. So I won't cover that, but we have had other grants come in this year, quite a few of them. And um, the financial status of the uh, Historical Society is quite good. It, uh, our annual appeal exceeded our expectations, or exceeded last year's anyway. But one of the other grants that we got was to a $75,000 grant from the Office of Tourism to redo the Smith Museum. That's on top of the work that our dedicated group of volunteers did earlier in the spring. Hopefully, you'll be able to see uh, the work, uh, completed work, uh, early this summer. Our tour guides did a superb job of hosting outside tours of the Jason Russell House this year. And hopefully, um, you'll be able to see an exhibit that Sarah put together called The Road to Revolution in the old assembly room. The lawn of the Jason Russell House is being repurposed uh, for events outside, uh, including the wildly successful beer garden that we did last summer. Uh, we're going to be doing the beer garden again on the lawn from June until about uh, early September. Um, we hope you'll come and join in the fun. Uh, none of what we've done would be possible without all of the volunteers and our members who make it all possible. I want to thank each and every one of you for your efforts and um, hope that you'll continue to support the society. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, here we are again, trying to do one of our lecture series for the Historical Society. Uh, as George said, it's been a tough year to make things happen this year. And just to orient you and me, I want to remind you of what we were about this year, which was our theme of called My Story Redux. And our plan was to redo some of the programs that we had to cancel the year before. And then, as it turns out, uh, we also are going to be showing you what we've been redoing here at the Jason Russell House and the Smith Museum. We had originally planned to do this program in October, uh, and what happened we've, was we had an October snowstorm. And so we canceled that program and decided that we would add it on to our January program, which is going to be a presentation on samplers, which Sarah will tell you about in a little bit. And what we're going to do now is give you an, an update on what we've done here at the Jason Russell House, Smith Museum, and our lawn. And first up for that is Robert Brazil, our vice president, who's going to tell you about this geothermal project. Lo and behold, today is the first day that we've had heat in the Jason Russell House. So what's going to allow us to do is to be able to open the house now in the, the winter time and to have air conditioning in the summer. And we hope that we will inspire many of you to come pay us a visit this next year. So Robert, take it away. Good evening. I'm Robert Brazil, and I'm here to tell you about a project that we have going on in the Jason Russell House. As you know, one of the society's core missions is the preservation of the Jason Russell House for future generations. And to that end, we've got an ongoing multi-year project to both restore the Jason Russell House in some cases and to, at the very least, preserve it for the future. Um, to that end, I'm going to tell you about a project that we have going on right now. All right, so as you know, the, the Jason Russell House um, is a historic property in Arlington that we have been in, uh, that has been in the care of the society for many years now. And one of the many things that the society does to look after it is, of course, we have uh, many volunteers, as, as George mentioned a few minutes ago, um, and we are very grateful to the work that the volunteers can do in that they bring sometimes expertise, they bring energy um, and their work to help us with the mission of the society. But some things cannot be done easily by volunteers and require trained professionals professionals trained in 
things like historic preservation, carpentry, um, artifact preservation, and the like. And so as a result, the society elected to see about what it could do to bring in some help to evaluate the house and come up with a plan for improving it. The Community Preservation Act is a state program that, that uh, allocates money through the towns to do work in the various towns and cities within the Commonwealth. And Arlington has a CPA committee that will hear grant proposals for this, these kinds of projects. And historic preservation is one of the categories of work that they will consider this for. So the society uh, put together a plan and went to the CPA committee and managed to get a grant to bring in a, a, an architect trained in historic preservation to do an analysis of the house. And what he produced was a condition assessment and preservation plan. And based on that, we came up with what you might call a roadmap for uh, phased work to bring the, the sort of the envelope, the building envelope, up to sort of modern standards for preservation for the future. This was done in a priority fashion. So the first priority, of course, was things like foundations, uh, you know, any, any way that water could get to the house, because, of course, water is a great enemy of houses. Uh, so doors, windows, and the like. And we've, we've managed to do a series of phases of that work over the past several years. This plan was pr produced in 2016, um, and we've managed to get through three uh, phases of that so far, of that project. Each year we go back to the CPA committee and propose the next phase. The current phase is a geothermal project. This is a project to enable climate control of the Jason Russell House for the first time ever, um, which will have several benefits that we'll discuss in the course of this. That geothermal work, as I said, is going on right now and we're starting to enjoy the results of it already, even though it isn't quite finished. Um, in addition, this year, We've gone back to the CPA committee, and there's no guarantees, of course, but if we're lucky, we hope to uh, get another grant to continue that on the work on that plan that I mentioned. In addition, one of the beautiful things about the CPA work is it's enabled us to demonstrate uh, to other granting authorities that we're serious about the work we're doing, that we're very careful stewards of those funds, and that we get our work done. We can show the work that was done from it, um, we've made very good progress, and we've been very careful to stay within the budgets that we've proposed. As a result, other granting authorities have made grants to us that we have enabled other kinds of work around both the house and the museum. So we're very grateful to the CPA committee, the local town, for working with us on this, both because of the direct effect that that work has had, but also because of the indirect uh, benefits that it has enabled. So really quickly, I want to outline sort of what's involved in, the, in this geothermal project. As you might expect from the title, geothermal, this is going to be taking advantage of properties of the earth. That is to say, the, the fact that 400 feet below the surface, it's a fairly constant temperature compared to what it is up in the air, up here where we are. So in the wintertime, when it's 15 degrees Fahrenheit outside, 400 feet down, it might be 50 degrees. Again, in the summertime, when it's 90 degrees and humid, it's nice and cool, about 50 degrees, 400 feet down. And you can take advantage of this, and that's what this system does. But in order to do that, we had to dig some wells, or well-like things, holes, very deep holes. And so as part of that, because um, we, are, we operate under some understanding with the state about how we care for this historic property, um, it, it was incumbent upon us to do some archaeological investigation um, before we went, you know, digging holes. We had to make sure we weren't going to be tearing up artifacts, things that people really needed to know about. So we last fall um, arranged for a ground penetrating radar survey of the property, and we had an archaeological service come in and do some uh, test digs around the property. They did find uh, a few odds and ends, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment. But once that was complete, that allowed us to go ahead and drill the holes for the geothermal wells, and then to do the work to do the change out of the HVA system that existed. Now I mentioned, you see here, I mentioned that there's a furnace. The furnace was not for the Jason Russell house. There's some addition, there's, there are other buildings on the property that the furnace served. 
but this HVA system is going to enable us to, to sort of update a lot of those systems. And then as part of that, of course, we had to update our electrical systems. The electrical systems have been in place for decades and have been modified multiple times and required some work to sort of clean them up and get them ready for this project. Once all that's done, HVA system, HVAC system goes in, and then we can run that system while we go back and clean up, I restore the lawn, get it back to the state it was in before all this work was done. So quickly about the uh, archaeological investigation. We are under preservation restriction from the Massachusetts Horticu uh, Horticultural <laughs> Historical Council. Uh, and, you know, they, they trust us, we're careful, but we don't want to do anything to cause them to feel like they need to get involved. So we went ahead and did the right thing, which was to arrange for this archaeological exploration. We've done some in the past. Um, haven't found a great deal, but we wanted to keep doing that because you, you just never know what you're going to find uh, when you go beneath the surface. Um, we had the archaeologists get a permit, and they went ahead and did a series of test pits um, that they dug uh, at the end of August last summer. Um, and they did find artifacts. There, there was archaeology there. They didn't find any sort of substantial building remains or, or anything like that, but, you know, some elements that that showed the history of the property um, that you would expect given it's been there for five or six hundred years, had multiple buildings built on top of it and, and taken down again. Um, and so that, you know, it, it, it's always useful to see what's there, even if it confirms there wasn't a lot there, at least not where we were uh, digging for the geothermal uh, project. Again, I mentioned we had a, a ground penetrating radar scan to sort of guide these digs and to help us either avoid things like services or to identify possible targets for digging. Um, as you can see, it was very involved. Uh, we didn't find anything, you know, very substantive in the process of this, but even that is a result. You know, that's, that's part of why we did it, is to make sure that we weren't going to be destroying anything. Let's talk about why we even went about this project. Constant temperatures in the house are much better for preserving historical artifacts than the wide swings in both temperature and humidity that the house has been subject to for several hundred years. With the ability to control the climate in the house, that has a number of good effects. One is that we can bring um, articles in our collection that we want to be able to show people and we can put them in situ. We can move them into the house and not worry about them deteriorating because of the wild swings in uh, climate. It allows us to consider having the Jason Russell House open in the winter as well as the summer. We would love to do that. We would love to welcome visitors when that is you know, more easily able to do uh, with the various conditions we're under now. Um, but it wasn't a very comfortable place to be, even for, either for visitors or for our volunteers and, and tour guides. So this is going to help that considerably. And it allows us to replace that old oil furnace that was mentioned and sort of uh, remove that as a risk to the property. In order to uh, plant these wells, we had to figure out where the trenches would go for both uh, the, the wells themselves and the pipes that serve them. And so those will connect to the uh, system that I will describe in just a moment. As you can see here, we had to lay them out very carefully to avoid trees, to avoid um, any other services that might be present, um, and to be efficient. You know, we don't want to be running uh, pipes willy-nilly all over the property. So we were very careful about that. So how does it work? Well, as you can see, we dug a series of 400-foot wells that we will take advantage of. They're basically loops that we will run, ref, run refrigerant through. When, when we say refrigerant, we're referring to a liquid that has really nice properties for heat transfer. Um, so it's not always for cooling. Sometimes it's for heating. But the idea essentially is that it's just a liquid. Think of it as a liquid that moves heat. And so the idea being that heat um, will be either moved into the house in the wintertime or out of the house in the summertime and it's done by, going, by being piped through these wells. This is how it works. So in the winter, the idea is that we take advantage of the very warm, comparatively, temperatures uh, beneath the Earth's surface in order to 
bring that heat into the house. So in effect, this is a, a giant heat pump. You, many of you will have heard of heat pumps, and they're, they're getting more modern all the time. People are installing them in their houses. This is a much more efficient and effective heat pump because it can take advantage of those warm temperatures down there or those cool temperatures depending on the time of year. So effectively what happens in the winter time is that the refrigerant is passed through the well which picks up heat from the earth and brings it into the house where it's sort of uh, amplified if you will and then it's pushed into the house. And as the heat leaves the refrigerant, it's piped, pumped back down into the earth to, to be heated again. As you might very well expect, in the summertime, it works the other way around. Heat in the house is absorbed into the refrigerant and then it's piped down into the, the ground. So the ground is a heat source in the winter and it's what we would call a heat sink in the summertime. It's a place to send the heat so that it's not in the house, effectively refrigerating it. So where are we now? This, so this, uh, as, as Patsy mentioned a moment ago, we're, this is already a little bit behind. We're, we're enjoying some of the benefits of the heat now, uh, even today. But we have dug the wells, you know, as of this uh, presentation that was given to the CPA committee uh, just a week ago or so. We've dug the wells. We managed to avoid removing trees, which we we're very happy about. We had to enlarge the small driveway that we had to allow the trucks to get in and the drilling rigs basically to get in and do their work, which we did. Um, we ha we're going to have to put that back, but of course we're going to put it back thoughtfully and I think we're going to make the entrance just a little bit bigger in the case of need for future services. Uh, we brought in the HVAC, it's in place and as you've now heard it's, it's somewhat op operational. Um, we did have to do some extra work on the electrical systems which uh, were a little less up to date than we might have hoped. Um, and that took some, caused the whole thing to take a little longer than necessary, but as you've heard, we've managed to push through that and get it done. The next steps, we need to go into the attic and install insulation. That's gonna help with ice dams on the roof and prevent heat loss and you know, makes the whole thing more efficient. And then we're gonna put the lawn back in March and April and restore the driveway, as I mentioned. So in summary, the society has been a faithful steward of the Jason Russell House since 1923. Similarly, we've tried to be a faithful steward of the state and town grant funds that we've received, and we've demonstrated that to all of our grant authorities so far. I think uh, we can safely say that they're fairly pleased with us in this, and hopefully we will enable more of this in the future. You saw that we got some other grants based on this initial work. All of those are one-time things. They're not sort of ongoing, we'll get that every year uh, kind of a thing. But it, it, it provides a good sort of resume, if you will, for going to future granting authorities. This geothermal uh, thermal climate control system will both better preserve and display our historical treasure, both the house itself and the artifacts that we can show within it. We're very grateful to all of you for your support in this. Without your help, we wouldn't get the support with the town, with the CPA committee, with the state entities that we've gone to that we have. Our local state representatives have been very helpful with this as well, and so we extend our thanks to them. And uh, hopefully at some point you will get to come and see the house and enjoy it for yourself. One of the things I have to say I find most thrilling about being a part of the Historical Society is this fabulous board that we're a part of. And following up on George saying that uh, we've been very successful at getting the CPA grants, I do want to acknowledge that George himself, Paul Fennelly, Robert, and Sarah, our director, uh, were, were totally instrumental in writing those grants and getting all the information. And certainly we are benefiting tremendously from that. This last September, when we had the beer garden, we had hundreds of people that came to the lawn. We had four perfectly beautiful September days, and people really took advantage of having a beer garden in Arlington. But what was amazing was the fascination that people had with this house, with the Jason Russell house. Most of the people would say, I know this house is here, but I've never been there. I didn't really quite know what it was all about. And very interested in learning more about it, particularly fascinated with the whole story of the bullet holes and the Revolutionary War that happened there. So our next presenter is our director, Sarah. And she's gonna be talking about the room we call the assembly room that leads into the Jason Russell House. 
and we have a new display there uh, that Sarah is primarily responsible for. She based the display on a uh, master's thesis that she did. It's called uh, The Road to Revolution, and uh, we're very proud of this new edition that we have, compliments of Sarah and Grant. I'm going to start off with this uh, kind of joke about a popular Twitter meme which illustrates the uh, the present and the, the past use of this room we call the assembly room. Uh, this room has had many purposes over the years. Um, it's been a gathering space for lectures, hence the assembly room title, which it was called that since 1924. Um, it's been an exhibition of objects uh, before the museum was built, um, kind of sundry projects as you see in the image on the left. Um, it seems like it was a gift shop from time to time, although it's hard to tell with some of the images if it's gift shop materials or if it's collections materials. Um, it was also an expansion of the, the, the exhibition that was in the Smith Museum for a period of time as well. And here's another how it started, how it's going, kind of the same section of the room at one point in time with some of those items that I recognize from the collection, and then on the right, the current exhibit, kind of the same corner, general view. Um, so the assembly room is this rare edition of an unknown date. You can kind of see on the left side of the Jason Russell House on that left image. Um, it, at, for a time, it was just a, a, a kind of a, an L edition, um, and it now is the, the part that leads into the Jason Russell House. Uh, one theory that I've heard that I think is probably most accurate is that it was a former a former L that was reused multiple times. You can see in the image on the right, you can see that little door and that little window and the kind of unusual chimney coming up. Some of those elements are seen in the assembly room today, so it could be a reuse of either that building or another building that was used somewhere else. <clears throat> so when I started working here, we had, this is kind of what we had on the various images. Um, the, the larger part of the room when you first walked in was taken up by this uh, loom, this large loom. Uh, it was what we called a barn loom, um, and then the rest was kind of a smattering of items with no other place to go. This large piano, um, just didn't have any storage space from it. And then we, um, the plan was that I was that was communicated to me was that it was going to be a rotating exhibit area. And the previous staff had begun collecting um, kind of sundry old jewelry cases and store cases to kind of make that make that plan work. Um, I kind of felt like uh, it might be, make more sense to have uh, rotating, rotating exhibits in the Smith Museum instead because of the location, because the, accessible, uh, the accessibility, the more open layout, and the, the fact that the, the assembly room leads into the Jason Russell House uh, made a lot of sense to have a permanent exhibit that made more sense to provide context for the Jason Russell House. Um, so that became part of my own kind of internal plan, eventually was established as part of our strategic plan, and we kind of did a couple of things on the way there. Um, one of them was to have something in there to buy us a little bit of time until we could make this project work. Um, and that was we used half of the space for a temporary exhibition. This was paid for by a local cultural council grant. Um, and we wanted to offer visitors something to see. And so we, we chose a subject that we thought would relate to the Jason Russell House. Um, and it was called Connecting Threads. Hopefully you got a chance to see it. Some of you got a chance to see it. Um, it explored the social life of colonial and post-colonial monotony. Uh, through a couple of themes, taverns and tea, communal work and neighborly exchange, and the church, the role of the church. And then as Patsy mentioned, I took a, a, a class in exhibit design, um, and this gave me a chance to begin thinking about it a little bit more detail. Um, uh, in, in the class, you could design the, an exhibition in any museum space. So I could have chosen like a room in the MFA <laughs> and done a, done a design for that. But I decided to, to do a real world example, even though it was a little bit more cha challenging because of the unwieldy um, nature of the space, all the little um, architectural elements, the small doors, the little fireplace. Um, so I decided to use that as a project. Um, this was an unusual way. Usually you uh, have all the concept conceptual planning up front. Um, and then you start doing object selection, and only then you do the, the exhibition design. Um, but in this case, we did kind of the reverse. Um, I did have to have a concept that I drew up, and that's what you can see here. Um, and this is the basic idea that um, is still the case in the finished product. And then we have the layout. Um, and what we want to do with exhi exhibition design is you, you don't typically want to have visitors go through a, a prescribed path. Um, that is chronological or need, needs to be ordered in some way. You want them to have um, kind of a more self-determined experience. Um, 
so, so that's what we kind of have. We have we have somewhat chronological through the day, but you could go anywhere in this, you know, you could start anywhere in this exhibit and just go right to it and still be able to grasp the whole the whole concept. Um, so it starts with the awakening, then the citizens and soldiers, and then kind of proceeds around. But again, you know, you can kind of kind of have that um, free choice learning experience that you want with a museum exhibit. Um, on the left, we have a, what, what's called a mood board. This kind of is, is just the, the kind of colors and like look and feel that you want for the exhibit. Um, the funny thing about this is that when we were looking for color schemes for the newsletter and some of our other printed materials, um, we actually decided to use this color scheme. So this is now kind of the color scheme that's in line with our current branding. So it turns out that the exhibit kind of is on brand for us in this kind of weird reverse order that we've been doing. Um, and then you can also see, I'm, I have some graphic design skills, <laughs> but not, not that good. So I decided to do kind of more rudimentary drawings of the plan. I'm not that good at drawing either, but um, it uh, kind of explains how everything should look. On um, the south wall, we have this kind of tavern scene um, with the window. And then uh, next to that is the citizen, citizen and soldiers section. And some of you might remember we had a... Um, grenadier mannequin. The plan was to use him and to also add an additional mannequin of a Minuteman, dressed as a Minuteman. Um, and then, what wall is this? This is the south wall all along. So here's our grenadier again. And proceeding along through all those, those different themes, the uh, places of safety, the old men in monotony, and the um, uh, defending their castles. And you'll see them in real time soon. And then on this east wall, which is kind of the smaller wall, and then we have this door that leads down into the, the basement of the Jason Russell house. It's, you know, again, part of that addition. Um, the plan was to move that painting, the Ruth Berry painting of the battle at the Jason Russell house to that wall. And then another mannequin to kind of tell the women's stories. So she would have been kind of the Elizabeth Russell figure potentially, um, some, some figure to kind of tell her her, her version of the, of the event, since we were talking about the defending the castles and especially the women's stories. Um, I intended to have this dark painted surfaces, the wallpaper around the fireplace, which did not happen. Maybe eventually we will be able to wallpaper in there, um, but for now it didn't. Um, but, and then we have the wounded and the dead section in the red. From there, we use this, these class materials to apply for a planning grant for, through Mass Humanities. Um, now, this organization emphasizes scholarly work, and they'd like you to bring on a consulting scholar. And we were lucky enough to have um, to bring on Robert A. Gross um, to be our consulting scholar for the project. Um, Gross is a former history professor for, at the University of Connecticut, and he specializes in social and cultural history, especially especially in the post-colonial and colonial era. He's really well known for this social history book, The Minutemen in Their World, which is like required reading if you're really interested in the context behind the Revolutionary War um, in this region. It's more Concord based, um, but really gives a lot of interesting details about you know, the, the various aspects of, of life in the, in the region and the time period. The first part of the project was the planning project that took about a year. Um, so we brought in Gross and we hired an intern named Isabel Williams and she worked, with, she worked with him and one of the guiding questions we gave her was how to appeal and remain relevant to modern audiences, um, especially Arl Arlington's population, the majority of which our research shows are not native to the region, um, either completely moved in from different regions in the U.S. or they've immigrated from other countries. Um, so Gross set her to the task of researching all of the individuals shown in this, this 1775 muster list through various primary sources that she was um, guided through by Gross. Um, and she was really surprised to find that um, we presumed that there'd be a lot of, I'm sorry, the list, we presumed there'd be a lot, this is a list from a little bit later in 1775, but we presume there'll be a lot of the same people that would have fought under Benjamin Locke in April of 1775. Some of the surprising details that she found were that a lot of the men on the list were from other towns or were transient in many other ways. Um, a lot of them were not property owners like Jason Russell. And this was a huge surprise to us because we tend to associate it with people defending their homes. You know, we use that term defending their castles. And um, in addition, she found four people of color on the muster list. Um, so this also married with one of our other goals, which was to be more diverse in our representation. And we decided to choose one well-documented person to highlight in our exhibition. So that's one change that we made in the exhibition from this grant. Um, and we were able to use these materials to go back to Mass Humanities for another grant, the Im implementation grant, and we were successful in that, in that endeavor. Um, 
Talking about a little, a few missteps, um, a couple of the objects that we had originally chosen. Once we did some, the more thorough provenance review, we found that um, the story that was, was given to us just didn't match up with the object itself, with the date of the object itself. Uh, in the upper left, we have a hat that was supposed to have been worn by um, Hannah Adams in her bed with her baby, that famous story that everybody knows. Um, we had an expert look at it, and the, the, the stitching and the style just didn't fit with that period. So unfortunately, we had to toss that what would have been an amazing object. Um, below, we have this buckle that the story was that it was taken from the stock of a dead British soldier. Again, same thing. Maybe there was a buckle that existed at one time and it got conflated with another, um, has been known to have happened. And then we have this teapot, which we were so excited because it was supposedly supposed to belong to Samuel Whittemore. It did belong to a Samuel Whittemore, but that was one of the descendants of the famous Samuel Whittemore, <laughs> not the one that we wanted to talk about in the exhibit. And then another thing that we had was we had some spectacles that were supposed to have belonged to Samuel Whittemore as well. That would have been perfect because we're talking about senior citizens and <laughs> so what's a more apt kind of object than a pair of spectacles. But when we looked in the collection record, that collection contained eight different pair of spectacles that all said the same thing. They all kind of, apparently they came from the house. I know Doris Birmingham, one of our volunteers, kind of joked that uh, Samuel Whittemore must have been like her and just lost his, or lost his glasses everywhere he went, but <laughs> we decided that just coming from the house where he lived probably wasn't enough for us to, uh, to uh, use that particular pair of spectacles. But we were able to find some things to substitute and make it still work. Here's a shot of the exhibition in process around January of 2020. We mocked things up with these kind of, uh, this is kind of a rudimentary way of doing things, but it still works super well printing things out poster style, taping them together, and taping them up on the wall. This helps to assess um, what sizes we need and to get the cost a little bit more in line with our budget. Unfortunately, we weren't able to go this large on the, the panels. I would have loved to have gone this large, but it just wasn't in the budget. Um, but a lot of those kinds of design kinks and things we kind of got to work out um, through this kind of mocking up process. And then the pandemic caused our April 19th, 2020 opening to come to a screeching halt. Um, 2021 didn't turn out to be in the cards either, um, but we did do some interesting video programming, some of you may have seen, um, in cooperation with various other sites in the National Park, and we did do some filming within the exhibition space, so it wasn't all wasted, um, and I'm kind of considering the, the exhibit to be on ice until we can hopefully open up this spring. It's all ready to go. <laughs> um, here's a short walkthrough of the space as it stands, um, and I hope you'll be able to see it in person in spring of 2022. Um, one change from the design that we decided to use based on, or was using the walkway on the way in, um, this kind of pass-through space that we can't really do much else with. Um, we want to keep it clean, and we want to avoid crowding uh, so that we have the accessibility that we need to get through that space. Um, so we used that for the introductory panel, and then we also used it to have this lovely map reproduced in wallpaper form, full-size map showing all the different sites um, of fighting on April 19th. You can see a little bit of the tavern scene, tavern scene through, that, through that door. And you can see that, how that looked from my original crazy drawings. Um, and then there is the New England Village on the left. This was a section that we completely added in, a complete new change. And this was based on um, our research and also to complement the third grade program where we talk a little bit about um, how town government, governance works, what a town meeting is, the role of the church within the town. Um, so we thought that this would be really useful or f useful for integrating into that program. And on the right is an interactive section for the Minuteman, the Minuteman section. And then we have the citizens and soldiers, the same idea as before, uh, to compare the idea of professional soldiery to common citizens, but instead we were only talking about Captain Benjamin Locke. We also wanted to look at, a, at that one of these people of color, and we decided to look at Cuff Whittemore. He was a formerly enslaved person of color who fought on April 19th, and also later in the, re in the revolution. Um, and it's really compelling to kind of compare and contrast these two figures who have such different backgrounds and different reasons for fighting. We kept uh, the same following subjects, and we replaced the cap with the sampler made by a girl who lost her father on April 19th. And the teapot from the old men section was replaced by this powder horn, uh, which was from the French and Indian War. Um, and then we have the Defending Their Castle section, and this mainly highlights Hannah Adams' story, complete with a blanket chest, communion silver, family cradle. The clock was too tall to fit, so we have a 90% size printed cutout facsimile. 
And one interesting find was a Bible that was said to have belonged to Hannah, and it had her name inscribed on it, and the date was right, and about 50 or so pages was ripped out of the back, so it looked like this was not one of those mythical stories. Um, further back, we have some shutters with musket ball holes in them from other houses, and then we have a planned inter interactive area with a bench um, that also serves the purpose of kind of blocking that cellar door so people don't try to go down there. And then on the right, we have the wounded and dead section. So one unintended compliment came, came from, a, we had an American Alliance of Museums reviewer who came out to assess our site, and she casually asked me which design firm we had hired to complete this work, um, which I, again, took as a compliment because usually these take cost, these kind of design firms charge hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this kind of work, and we were able to do it in, I think, oh, about 20 to 30,000, so thank you. Speaking of compliments, I just want to add that, as you can hear, Sarah is very responsible for a lot of grant funding that we've gotten here, and one piece of feedback we got was that one of the grants that she wrote, the people said, was the best example of grant writing and that it could be used as a model for other places. So kudos to Sarah. <laughs> right. So as, as many of you know, uh, one of the things I have been active in in Arlington is being the event coordinator. And in fact, in our civic block, we have four event sites in Arlington that all of which share being an event site along with some activity. We have the Whittemore Robbins House, which is a, a counseling program during the day. We have the town hall, which obviously is the town hall. We have our library, and we have the Masonic Hall, all of which are beautiful buildings that um, have been bringing in income for all of those different institutions uh, as events, with bridal showers, uh, weddings, bar mitzvahs, concerts, fundraisers. And I suggested to the board here at the Historical Society that might be something that we could also do, given that the Smith Museum, if it were renovated, could be an indoor space that could be matched with our beautiful outdoor space and could be the possibility of, again, a shared experience of being both a museum and an event site and a source of um, more income for the Historical Society. So we had the uh, possibility of having money come in from our ear earmark funding through the legislature and determined that that could be a good place to put this money to use. And while we were sitting around waiting to see what the legislature would be doing, I think it was Alan Jones who said, or Chuck, who said, why don't we do some of the beginning work ourselves? And so that's what we decided to do. And a year ago, January, we came in and basically we were a wrecking crew to begin to take out the old display and get ready to have a new display and the possibility of doing events here. So Chuck is going to talk with you through what all we did. Thank you, Patsy, and uh, thanks to all of you for finding us here on YouTube in this very modern way that we're doing our programs these days. Years ago in pre-pandemic times, we're talking 2018 or 19, a committee was formed, as Patsy mentioned, to rethink this place where we are now, the Smith Museum. We had in mind that um, we want to make it more modern and more appealing and most of all, more versatile. But we gradually realized uh, as we plant this out, that this was going to be a big deal. We were going to have to make drastic changes, real big boy construction following serious demolition. It was the kind of uh, project that you usually hire consultants for, maybe even architects and contractors and so forth. Well, we couldn't afford that because the uh, $75,000 that's been mentioned uh, several times before this evening uh, just wasn't in our hands yet. It got stalled in the legislature and it became clear that if we wanted to make this happen, we were just going to have to do it by ourselves. But we then realized, we did a lot of realizing in those days, that uh, if we were going to uh, work shoulder to shoulder that way, we were going to have to wear masks, and I don't mean the kind that are for construction dust. You know what I mean. Well, that was a lot to think about, uh, but we uh, just knew we had to do it. So uh, from out of the committee, we extracted a team, a crew, we called ourselves and rolled up our sleeves and got to work. And I'm here 
now, as Patsy said, to tell you how that all went. We think it went very well, and I hope you think the same when I'm done here. So let's begin by asking the obvious question, what was it about the Smith Museum that needed all of this attention? Well, there were three big issues, all of them uh, visible in this photograph to some extent. Number one, the floor space was overwhelmed by six large, heavy, immobile cases installed in 1996 and 97. Number two, the walls are of concrete block, which is frankly not something you want to hang a picture on, and hanging things on the wall is what a museum is all about. And number three, the space was very woody, designed that way in the light, late uh, 80s to imitate a barn, I'm told, a colonial barn. And most of the wood, unfortunately, was knotty pine, which not only clashed with the concrete, but for me, uh, always had a sort of 1970s rec room vibe that wasn't too appropriate. So back to uh, problem number one. Uh, the cases, which also included, by the way, this major sort of stage set affair in the middle of the room, which was quite large as well. Which meant the final curtain for the final uh, ties exhibit. We just had to get rid of all of this. That went up, family ties went up in uh, 2007. And we were going to have to take all of that down. Here's uh, Alan and Elizabeth at work uh, finishing off that, uh, that wall. That's the, an excellent shot of the zigzag wall, a stud wall and plasterboard in which the cases themselves were always embedded. And you can see the zigzag nature of those cases that took up so much space. Let me show you that in a floor plan. Just to get you oriented, the back door is to your left and the front entrance is to your right and the upstairs office is rec represented by that green perimeter. Here is the problem. Six of those monsters jutting into the room. And not only that, they basically killed the usefulness of the space behind them. So let's include that in what's going to end up uh, causing a problem. And then there was that middle part. All of that was destined to be in a dumpster. And here we go, rolling up our sleeves. I, uh, did, I don't think I mentioned that these cases were also poorly lit. Alan is removing the old fluorescent lighting there. And also rather shallow. You really couldn't put very deep uh, three-dimensional objects in them. And if you were of a mind to, you better have three people on hand because the only way to get into the cases was take the very heavy glass off, which was downright dangerous. And here we go again. Uh, this is another day. Uh, this is uh, Alan removing a 19th century fireman's ladder, part of our collection, which had been stashed behind that case. And that's Robert uh, s uh, salvaging a solid oak two by eight, I believe. Very heavy, as was everything that we were tearing out. Here's um, salvaging the bronze. We were very careful to save all of that because we thought it might be worth a few hundred dollars. We uh, 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 collected 504 pounds of bronze and sold it to a scrap metal place in Lynn for a tidy sum of $840. Very nice. That was more than sufficient uh, for our rental of a very large dumpster. There's Robert Allen and Elizabeth. I think in the several days that uh, this was part of the thing was going on, uh, those three people must have lifted a ton of stuff, and I don't use that figuratively. I mean, practically a ton. And now, finally, that we have the place cleared out and can uh, bring in some materials, here they come because by that time we had enough money from the society to buy some raw materials. And here comes our solution to the concrete block problem. 20 sheets of plywood, but don't panic, we're not embracing wood again. This is a very special kind of plywood called 
MDO, the O is for overlay, which just means this luscious primer, it's easy to paint, it's very permanent. And these panels are what's going to hide most of the concrete block, as you see in the background. Some of them are already on the wall. Took a lot of work uh, working with the edges, though, because those were going to show. You can also see in the background that the panels don't actually touch, so the edges would be standing out. And so a lot of work was uh, to be done, here seen by Kenton and Dan. Lots of spackling and sanding and painting because those edges would be featured. And up they went over a period of three or four days. And how precisely, you may be asking, do you attach an 80-pound panel to a concrete block wall? I've just said concrete is impenetrable, so uh, how do you do that? Well, you do it very carefully with a lot of special jigs and platforms to hold the thing while it's going up. And you use screws, concrete screws, that large three inches long, three eighths in diameter, buck a piece on Amazon. So our gallery had become a factory, basically. There's a shot with all, uh, most of the uh, panels up and here they all are in place and ready to be painted. In the meantime, because something was always going on in the meantime, we were addressing, uh, we were arranging for the extinction, I should say, of all of that knotty pine, especially up there on the mezzanine. It's been stripped down there. See, all of the knotty pine is gone. And then uh, we added some subtle uh, curves, various little decorative touches there on the corners. There are smaller MDO panels ready for painting and painted. Our painting scheme uh, came to pass only after lots of uh, emailing and disagreement. Uh, three shades of gray. Here's Robert putting on the darkest ones on the big panels. And here's me worrying about the knotty pine again. There was a lot of it around the staircases, and uh, in this case we decided not to remove it, but to cover it over with studs and a wall. The Side benefit of that was that we also got some additional display space. So Robert creating a little uh, triangular stud wall to fill the triangular void there in the background. And here it is finished. Sarah could not wait to put up something, anything on and in front of that wall just so it would look like some future exhibit. That's still in the background here as I speak. And uh, Patsy couldn't wait either. She did a temporary staging with plants from our house and silver uh, from uh, the kitchenette. The gallery as it looked after we crew members were pretty much done, already looking more attractive, I think you would say. Uh, but um, call you, I call your attention to the new cases. They weren't really new, but uh, they were new to us, inherited from the Concord Historical Society. And we quickly equipped them with sliders on the bottom so that they could be moved around and become an essential part of our uh, idea of a more versatile space. Let me go back to our floor pan plan and show you what I mean. That's the problem we started with. And here's how we solved it. Smaller cases that you can move around. We have many more than that, but this is just a quick example. Whatever you want to do for an incoming exhibit, move those around and, and make it right. Also remember that because those cases are much shorter, they do not block the wall. So let's put a, some orange to represent even more display space, brand new. But as been mentioned earlier, we uh, we're also fully aware that it might not be true that a museum has to be a display space 24-7, 365. Why can't you use it for other purposes? You can now because you can move these display cases off to the edge. They can still have the contents in them and be attractive, causing attention, and, and people can go over and look into them. But those people can be at a meeting, let's say, with lots of chairs, or perhaps you put the people over at the other end of the room under the mezzanine if it's a slideshow. So many things are possible now that we don't have those monsters jutting from two directions into the space. 
But back to the construction site, because although it does look tidy here, notice that the ceiling has not yet been painted gray, and neither has, yes, more wood. We, the, the crew, did not choose to solve that problem because we're of a certain age and didn't want to climb any ladders that high or that high. There were never, the, in addition, there were uh, problems with the plaster up high and we're glad that we turned to professionals at this point because yes, finally, in October, I'm sorry, in November, our grant money had come through. The crew, the uh, professionals did a great job of protecting uh, pieces of the uh, collection that were directly underneath the uh, mezzanine at that point. And if you look on the other side of that plastic, there's Sarah and Melinda who had to vacate the office upstairs and make do. And presto, after four, only four days of painting, they finished early, a much warmer, dramatic feel to the gallery. But wait, what's, what's that? mess underneath the gallery there, those, the shelves bulging with the collection. Why is that upstairs? It's supposed to be down here in the collection room. But the collection room was due to be renovated too, repainted and all, so all of this stuff had to come temporarily upstairs to be digitized while it was there. Photographs made and entries made into the computer. That's been going on for weeks and weeks by a whole different set of volunteers. Three cheers for volunteerism. That's really what this is all about. Meanwhile, down in the collection room, we still had to figure out how to put some big stuff, such as this ice cutting tool. Uh, that's probably did duty on uh, Spy Pond, even back in the day when Spy Pond would freeze over. And here, rather abruptly, my renovation progress report has to stop without any grand finale. Because our grand finale has just not happened yet, we still have plenty of stuff to do, some of which I've described. We also have to carpet this place and maybe most exciting, put up lighting, which we were about to spend huge bucks for, for a consultation and so forth. Alan Jones, again, uh, who's on camera right now, saved uh, our day by doing practically all of that himself, designing it, and he'll be soon be putting it up. Thank you, Alan. You work for free, don't you? I hope so. Good. So, that's all good news. And with luck, we will have a grand finale in a few months, and then, if we're really lucky, and things calm down in the general society, if you know what I mean. Shortly after that, we will have a grand opening. Yes, coming soon, we hope. Please attend. Thank you. So as Chuck said, uh, we're really looking forward to the spring. Right now we are indeed in chaos, but it's organized chaos. We're waiting for the, the uh, collections room to be done within the next week or two. Once that's done and we move all of this stuff down, we'll have carpeting and lighting. And all of this is, is leading into what will be our first new museum display. And we're calling that a few of my favorite things. And we're asking all board members and some of the volunteers to choose something from our collection that is a favorite and then uh, write up a little uh, background on why it's their favorite and that will be part of what we'll display come end of March and early April. So let me show you what I have for my favorite. So here is my favorite, which is a copper bathtub. Uh, it was from the estate of Mrs. H. H. Homer has its own soap uh, holder here, and somehow you get water to go in from here. I was asking Sarah if we had any idea how the water, I think this would be pre-garden hose, so who knows whether they had like a long spout on a pitcher to put it in. Uh, it's my favorite actually because I get credit for finding it. Uh, it was down in the furnace room up on a big concrete platform with all kinds of, of trash type stuff in front of it. And I was down there kind of cleaning around and, and discovered this thing and pulled it out and I showed Sarah and she said, oh, that's where it was. So there was some other historical society had sent out, they were looking for a copper bathtub and she knew 
knew from our, our collections records that we had one, couldn't find it anywhere, and I am the discoverer. This is my favorite thing, and it's called a zoetrope. Uh, it's an optical toy, um, and it illustrates a, 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 a phenomena called persistence of vision. This is the uh, phenomena that makes things like uh, animation possible. It's the eye's ability to kind of stitch things together, stitch individual images together, and make them appear like they're moving. Um, this isn't particularly unique. It was uh, manufactured in 1867 by Milton Bradley. Uh, belong to an Arlington family, an a tool for entertainment. You look through the little slots and you spin this around and you have little uh, strips of paper that have different images and you see a kind of a cartoon, repeating cartoon uh, through the little slots. So come the spring and with fingers crossed that COVID continues to wane, we will indeed have this historical society open again. The Jason Russell House will be open for guided tours, uh, air conditioned if needed. Uh, the new assembly room display will be available. Uh, the Smith Museum will be available with this new display that we just talked about, my favorite things. And come June, there will be the beer garden. So there is really a lot of things to come pay a visit for us. And the most exciting thing is Sarah will have delivered a baby by then. So we hope that you will come and join us at the Historical Society, Smith Museum and Jason Russell House. <laughs>